Welcome everybody. Um, my name is Kara Brodfier and I am a senior counsel over here at the Department of Fair Employment and Housing. I very, very much apologize for the late start. We had some technical difficulties as you do with all these different Zoom applications, um, but we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I just wanted to introduce our amazing panelists. Um, we have Dee Abuyunes, um, who's a staff attorney at Public Counsel. We have Gianni Interiano Brown, who is a staff attorney at the Child Care Law Center. And we have Ritu Mahajan, who's a supervising senior staff attorney at Public Counsel. And I just wanna thank all of them for um, being a part of this webinar. Um, given the number of people that have registered, it looks like there's a lot of interest in this subject. So I'm really glad that we are here doing this webinar. And I just wanted to encourage people, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. Um, the Q&A will allow us to kind of field questions live and will give us a chance to um, keep track of the questions so we know we get to you. Um, and if you are an attorney and would like to receive MCLE credit, um, we're gonna have a link at the end of the webinar. Um, so you just click on it and follow the directions so we can give you that credit. Also, um, we're gonna be putting a link in the chat if we haven't done so already um, with the PowerPoints in both English and Spanish. And I just wanted to quickly say that this guidance is only for informational purposes. Um, we're not giving legal advice. We're not establishing policy. Um, you know, the opinions that are presented by the people presenting today, they don't necessarily reflect the opinions of DFEH. And just to give you a very quick amount of background on DFEH, um, we're the Department of Fair Employment and Housing. We're California's civil rights agency. And our mission is to protect the people of California from unlawful um, discrimination in employment, housing, businesses, state-funded programs, bias-motivated violence, and human trafficking. And we do many different things to try and make that happen. Um, we do public outreach and engage with the public, which we're doing right now. Um, we investigate discrimination complaints and cases of systemic discrimination. Um, we facilitate mediation and resolutions of disputes. And we sometimes even enforce the laws by prosecuting violations in court. So we're going to quickly just do a little poll um, just to see who's here and who is going to be at, who is present at the webinar. So I'm going to ask Alex to put the, um, the poll up on the screen. And we're just asking who's here. So are you a child care provider, a housing provider, owner, or landlord? Are you from an advocacy organization? Are you an attorney or are you none of the above? Just to give us an idea. Cara, during this time, um, can we also have our Spanish interpreter announce the interpretation? Absolutely. Sorry. <laughs> In the stop part. Hola, buenos días todos. Uh, mi nombre es Brittany. Yo voy a estar um, interpretando. Uh, pronto vamos a encender la función de la traducción, uh, dependiendo de qué aparato tienen ustedes. Uh, si es computadora o celular, abajo debe de ver tres puntitos. En los tres puntitos va a haber un globito, uh, o tal vez tenga un globito. Uh, va a haber language interpretation. Va a seleccionar esa opción. Va a poner Spanish o español, uh, la idioma que mejor le corresponde a usted. Um, y va a poner uh, mute, original audio, para que no tenga que oír ambos voces. Y después va a poner done o finalizar. Um, voy a probar el canal español. Si tienen alguna pregunta, duda o si tienen uh, dificultad, por favor, déjenme saber a sus órdenes. Gracias. Thank you for that. Sorry, I missed um, having you introduce yourself at the beginning. Um, and Alex, if you could put up the results of the poll. All right, it looks like we have a pretty um, varied group. Um, more than half of you are child care providers. We have some housing providers. We have folks from advocacy organizations and nonprofits, attorneys and others. So a really diverse group, which makes for an exciting training. So I'm gonna now pass this on to my fantastic um, panelists. Thank you. 
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our training. Um, thank you so much, Cara, for the introduction and thank you to all the support staff and our interpreter today for assisting us on this training. At the Child Care Law Center. Um, just a brief introduction to the Child Care Law Center. We are a legal support center whose mission it is to educate, advocate, and litigate to improve child care availability for families, children, and providers uh, throughout the state of California. And so today we're going to be talking about housing protections for family child care providers. And before we get into our legal material, I would like to provide a brief overview of family child care. Many of you on today's training might be familiar with family child care, whether you attended a family child care home yourself, um, maybe you currently use a family child care provider to meet your child care needs, or perhaps you personally know a family child care provider. But for those of you who are unfamiliar, family child care providers are individuals who provide licensed child care from their own home, and that home can be rented or owned. Um, their, their homes are therefore referred to as family child care homes. And family child care providers have either a small license or a large license, which indicates how many children these providers are licensed to care for by the state of California. And these providers and their family child care homes are exclusively regulated by the California Department of Social Services Community Care Licensing Division, also referred to as Community Care Licensing. And family child care providers must also comply with the California Health and Safety Code, as well as the California Fire Code. And please note, as we go forward with the material, when we refer to uh, providers, we are talking about family child care providers. Next slide, please. So family child care providers, as I mentioned, may rent, lease, or own their own home. And family child care providers are really an essential part of our state and national workforce, providing vital support to children, families, and our local communities. So let's think about our essential workers and those who have night shifts. This vital workforce often needs child care that offers a flexible schedule um, outside of the common nine to five window. Now, during the COVID-19 pandemic, as a lot of us saw, family child care providers served and continue to serve this group of working families. And other parents do choose family child care because of its flexible hours, along with its nurturing home environment and often convenient location in local neighborhoods. And family child care homes serve as the primary source of care to babies and toddlers in California. And many providers also meet the diverse cultural and linguistic needs of California's families. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's take a look at this pie chart. And this pie chart shows us how great the need was for California licensed childcare back in 2019. In 2019, the chart shows us that California only had enough licensed childcare to meet the need of 24.5% of families. As you can see, even before the COVID-19 pandemic, there were great shortages in licensed childcare in California. And with the pandemic came childcare closures, both temporary and permanent, which resulted in even higher demand for licensed childcare as families continued to go back to work. Family childcare is the most frequently chosen form of childcare, but parents often can't find care because of the high demand or are forced to cobble together unreliable situations. And this is a common problem frequently faced by working families. Now, with regards to housing, there are already barriers facing California residents in securing a safe place to live, historically and especially now during this pandemic. In addition to those barriers, childcare providers' status as providers is acting as a barrier for these individuals while they look for and try to secure housing. And as we've seen in our work, housing discrimination is not only impacting California child care providers' access to stable housing, housing discrimination is also impacting the availability of child care throughout California. Next slide, please. 
So prior to um, the passing of the Child Daycare Facilities Act 40 years ago, family child care providers were facing many issues. Um, for example, cities and counties had interpreted and actually expanded the authority, um, their authority under the act. And in doing so, many cities and counties were requiring far more from family child care providers outside of the four areas that they were allowed to regulate. Those areas being spacing and concentration, traffic, parking, and noise. So in the field, the Child Care Law Center was seeing cities requiring that providers have a certain number of difficult to secure off-street parking spaces, city planning departments requiring that providers obtain and include architectural drawings of their homes with zoning permit applications and much more. So regarding the architectural drawings requirement, that requirement cost one provider over $10,000 and forced her to close her family childcare after only a few years in business, never fully recuperating the high cost she was forced to pay to complete her zoning permit application. Overall, the high costs involved in providing childcare were extreme, leaving family childcare homes with profits that seldom exceeded minimum wage for the childcare providers themselves. Something needed to be done to eliminate these barriers placed by cities and counties on family childcare. And that is when the California Child Daycare Facilities Act um, came into play as an incredibly helpful piece of legislation passed to tackle these barriers. And the intent behind this law was to provide a comprehensive quality system for licensing child daycare facilities to ensure a quality childcare environment. Next slide, please. So the Daycare Facilities Act acknowledged the lack of childcare was a statewide concern. And it acknowledged the fact that many families preferred to access childcare in their own local neighborhoods. The act was also a response to more parents entering the workforce, which had increased the need of childcare statewide. Furthermore, the legislative intent behind this act sought to emphasize that childcare licensing had to be affordable, easy to regulate, and not heavily burdensome on providers. Next slide, please. So let's fast forward to um, post-2008, after the economic recession. Childcare began to steadily decrease, yet cities and counties had steadily increased their requirements for family childcare homes, while charging higher and higher fees to operate family childcare. For example, cities and counties were still requiring expensive zoning permit fees and burdensome applications, expensive business license fees, expensive and very specific items that were often impossible for providers to obtain, and were restricting how, how many children providers could actually care for. And childcare providers were also struggling to secure housing due to their status as family childcare providers, and were facing resistance from people like landlords, people on HOAs or homeowners associations, property managers, leasing agents, realtors, insurance companies, and even neighbors. For instance, many providers had their rental applications denied, were explicitly turned away from rental homes, had their rent or security deposits raised, had evictions filed against them, and or were harassed and even asked to move by landlords, homeowners associations, or others, all because they planned to or operated a family childcare home. So in light of these barriers, the Child Daycare Facilities Act really needed to be clarified uh, to protect providers from discrimination and needed to explain how family childcare homes could be and could not be regulated by bodies outside of community care licensing. With family childcare providers and advocates, the Child Care Law Center took these issues straight to city councils and individual cities where family child care providers educated city council members and family about family child care and the difficulties these providers were facing when trying to meet all of these city and county requirements. On a positive note, when city governments finally understood the barriers that they were creating for child care in their communities, 
they made some changes which resulted in more childcare for families in their own communities. So in addition to these steps being taken, the Keeping Kids Close to Home Act was passed into law in 2019, which strengthened and clarified housing protections for family childcare providers in the Daycare Facilities Act. Now, the Keeping Kids Close to Home Act, or Senate Bill 234, was intended to increase the availability of family childcare by decreasing costs and unnecessary barriers faced by family childcare providers so that they could open, stay open, and care for more children. This new law also wanted to give providers the peace of mind in running their family childcare and ensure that they were treated with both dignity and respect. The act did become effective on January 1st of 2020, just before the pandemic hit. Now, since this law went into effect right before the COVID-19 public health crisis, many cities and counties were unable to update their ordinances to reflect this new law. Even today, many cities and counties still have not updated their ordinances to reflect these new important changes for family child care providers. So what did the Keeping Kids Close to Home Act change exactly? Well, to address the burdensome regulations of family child care homes on the local level, the Keeping Kids Close to Home Act established that all family child care homes, both small and large family child care homes with small and large licenses, must be considered a residential use of property for the purposes of all local ordinances. And to address concerns raised by providers struggling to access rental housing due to their family child care homes, this law also established that family child care homes must be allowed in all types of residential settings, from apartment complexes to duplexes, to single family homes, to even condos and mobile homes. Next slide, please. So to address housing discrimination against family child care providers in rental homes, the act also clarified that it is unlawful to refuse to rent to someone because they operate a family child care home. Next slide, please. So the original Child Day Care Facilities Act was toothless in its enforcement mechanism in the ways in which providers could seek recourse and remedies when their rights under the act were violated. In response, the Keeping Kids Close to Home Act added language that remedies and procedures in the Fair Employment and Housing Act, also referred to as FEHA, were available to family child care providers, people applying for family child care licenses, and individuals whose protections may have been denied under relevant sections of the Facilities Act. Now, this cross-reference to the Fair Employment and Housing Act was a key victory in the Keeping Kids Close to Home Act because lower courts found that providers bringing discrimination cases didn't have a cause of action for a violation under the California Child Day Care Facilities Act. Rather, providers would need to establish that they were a part of a protected class and bring claims under other civil rights laws, such as the UNRWA Civil Rights Act and the Fair Employment and Housing Act or the Fair Business Practices Law. This posed an extra procedural hurdle for providers to overcome. Now, with this added provision in this new act, Family child care providers are explicitly afforded the remedies and procedures that are offered under the Fair Employment and Housing Act for violations under the Child Daycare Facilities Act. Under Government Code Section 12980, which is now cross referenced in the Facilities Act, family child care providers have the right to file discrimination claims in Superior Court and complaints with the Department of Fair Employment and Housing. Please note that family child care providers may have other civil rights claims. The Child Care Law Center just encourages using this as a potential approach in addressing fair housing claims. Additionally, there is no case law using this statute as of yet. And finally, another barrier still facing providers was the lack of guidance in how the Office of the State Fire Marshal could regulate family child care homes. 
Well, thankfully, the Keeping Kids Close to Home Act now requires that the Office of the State Fire Marshal provide guidance that applies statewide about family child care homes and to keep its code current in its regulation of family child care homes. This means that when large family child care homes need a fire inspection clearance from local fire departments, those departments must apply fire standards uniformly. The next slide, please. Now let's discuss protections um, from local government regulations covered in the Keeping Kids Close to Home Act. The Keeping Kids Close to Home Act does the following. First, cities and counties cannot regulate the use of family child care homes, but must treat them like all other residential homes. Second, the law states that small and large family child care homes must be considered a residential use of property and a use by right for the purposes of all local ordinances, including but not limited to zoning ordinances rather than seen as a commercial use of property as they were before. Next slide, please. Additionally, the law now prohibits cities and counties from mandating that providers apply for and receive zoning permits to operate a family child care home, such as a conditional use permit, administrative use permit, minor use permits, or just plain use permits. Furthermore, if a provider lives in an area zoned for any type of residential use, cities and counties cannot require providers to get a zoning permit for only having a family child care home. Also, the law now prohibits cities and counties from requiring family child care homes have a business license as an in-home business operation, even if those business licenses would be at no cost to the provider. Now, local governments may also call the license a business fee, a local business tax, or a home occupation permit, depending on where folks live. And lastly, cities and counties can no longer have specific rules that apply solely to family child care homes. Additionally, cities and counties can no longer create special requirements for large family child care homes in areas of spacing and concentration traffic control and noise control. Next slide, please. There are some exceptions to the law restricting local government regulation of family child care homes. First, cities and counties may apply local requirements to family child care homes only if the same requirement applies to all other homes in the provider's zoned area. Second, family child care providers must comply with local fire department fire clearance requirements if they are licensed for and want to operate a large family child care home. And lastly, family child care providers must meet all state health and safety requirements. And for the next section, I will turn it over to my co-presenter from Public Council, D. Thank you. Thank you, Gianni, and hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Dee Abiyunis. I'm a staff attorney with Public Council's Early Care and Education Law Unit. The program's goal is to maintain and increase the supply of quality early care and education in Los Angeles County by um, helping providers overcome legal and administrative barriers to opening and operating their child care program. So now we're moving into family child care provider housing protections under the Act concerning private actors. Um, under the Keeping Kids Close to Home Act, private actors such as landlords, property managers, leasing agents, realtors, HOAs, mortgage companies, and homeowners insurance companies cannot prevent or prohibit a tenant or homeowner from planning to or operating a family child care home. For example, a provider cannot be prohibited from providing licensed family child care in their home for up to six children if they have a small license or up to 12 children if they have a large license. Furthermore, the law states that providing childcare in one's home is a residential use of property, as Gianni mentioned, and must be treated that way. So for example, even if, a, even if a provider's rental agreements or lease states that they can't have a business or use the residence for commercial purposes, this part of the agreement would be void because the law sees family childcare homes as a residential use of property. Next slide, please. 
Additionally, under the law, landlords, property managers, leasing agents, and realtors cannot deny a provider's rental application just because they operate a family child care home. And furthermore, they can't harass a tenant into leaving or try to evict them because they operate a family child care home, such as through um, a provision in the lease agreement or the HOA agreement. It's illegal for landlords and other leasing agents to do so. You'll want to note here that even if a landlord, property manager, or HOA gives a provider tenant a no-cause eviction notice, it's illegal for them to evict a provider tenant if the real reason is because they have a family child care home. Continuing on to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit more about private actors. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, under the Keeping Kids Close to Home Act, HOAs cannot harass or restrict the use of the resident's family child care home. For homeowners who belong to a homeowners association or an HOA, HOAs cannot seek to remove a homeowner solely because they want to or currently operate a family child care home. It's important to note that any portion of a lease um, contract or other agreement that restricts someone from using a property as a family child care home is void and unenforceable. HOAs, mortgage companies, lenders, and other individuals cannot refuse to sell or rent to an applicant because they are a family child care provider. Next slide, please. So the act also includes protections against unlawful conduct by the insurance providers. Um, so first, um, family child care providers are not required by law to carry child care liability insurance, but they're frequently pressured by landlords and HOAs into obtaining it. When a family child care provider is a tenant, the law prohibits landlords and HOAs from requiring that providers have liability insurance, although it's highly recommended that providers do obtain their own insurance. Under the law, landlords cannot restrict a family child care home. This includes mandating that the provider obtain insurance. Next slide, please. Um, and although family child care providers cannot be required to carry liability insurance by a landlord or HOA, um, if a landlord or HOA requests that a family child care provider add them to the provider's liability insurance, the provider must add them if all of the following are met. So first, the provider already has or is getting a liability insurance policy. Second, their landlord or HOA asks in writing to be added to the policy. And then their policy will not be canceled if the landlord or HOA is added. And finally, their landlord or HOA pays the higher premium amount if there is one for adding them. Next slide, please. So now we'll look at protections against unlawful conduct by the insurance providers themselves. There are two types of insurance that we need to discuss. So one is the child care liability insurance, and the second is homeowner's insurance, uh, a homeowner's insurance policy. We've also seen homeowner's insurance providers unlawfully refusing to cover family child care home, raising insurance rates for homeowners solely based on the family child care home that's operated on the property, and threatening to cancel or failing to renew an insurance policy because the homeowner rents to or operates a family child care home. Under the law, family child care providers also have protections against unlawful discrimination by insurance providers in the realm of homeowners insurance policies. Specifically, the law prohibits insurance companies from canceling or not renewing a homeowners insurance policy because there's a family child care home on the property. Next slide, please. Additionally, when a property is used for residential purposes, Refusing an application for or canceling an insurance policy based on the source of income of the individual or group of individuals residing at the property is prohibited. So if um, their uh, income is coming from family child care home and they're um, refusing to renew or they're canceling the insurance policy based on this income, um, that is prohibited. You'll want to note that this protection against unlawful treatment by insurance providers also covers landlords renting to family child care providers. So for example, if a landlord rents to a provider, their homeowner insurance policy can't be canceled solely because they rent to a family child care provider. And I'll pass it back to Gianni for um, the rest of the slides. Thank you, Dean. So now we've talked about changes around local regulation, changes around what private actors such as landlords can and cannot demand of family child care providers, and we've discussed what insurance providers, both childcare liability insurance providers and homeowner insurance providers can and cannot do when engaging with a family childcare home. 
Now let's talk about what the Keeping Kids Close to Home Act does not change. Well, first, it does not change the special written property owner or landlord consent requirement. Um, so family child care providers only have to provide 30 day notice to their landlord or the property owner when they plan to ap operate a family child care home. This requirement applies to providers with either a small or a large license. In contrast, landlord or property owner's consent is required only under a specific circumstance. For example, if a provider seeks to care for two additional school-age children, in addition to the maximum number of children they're allowed to care for under their license, that provider must obtain the consent of the landlord or property owner before doing so. Please note that landlord property owner consent is not needed to change from a small to a large license. And we do wanna share this information because many people are misinformed that they must have consent in every situation uh, with the property owner and landlord when it is in fact only in a very certain situation. Um, local zoning and building requirements also do not change under the Keeping Kids Close to Home Act and are still in effect. Next slide, please. So in addition to those two things, other health and safety requirements that family child care homes must follow per the California Department of Social Services Community Care Licensing Division also do not change and must be followed. And finally, local fire department fire clearance requirements for large family child care homes do not change and must be followed. And please note, even the local fire requirements must comply with state law and be uniform statewide. Okay, so before we get into some hypotheticals to test our knowledge on this subject, I will note that if you have a question or a comment, please place that into the questions and answers section below your, um, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and with that, I will pass it over to Dee to run through our first few questions. Okay, so we're going to jump into some hypotheticals so you can see how this might play out in a real life situation. Um, so in this first hypothetical, um, sorry, sorry, so we're going to um, be administering some uh, poll question after each hypothetical so you can choose yes or no um, in response to the question, um, the question posed. Um, so in this first hypothetical, Tina Tennant is a family child care provider who has recently moved into an apartment complex. She notified her landlord, Larry, of her family child care home, and in response, Larry told her she could only be open during weekdays and during daytime hours. And the question is, can Larry, uh, landlord, do this? Is this legal? I think we're going to um, start up the poll and so you all can answer when the question pops up for you. So maybe we can um, put the uh, responses up. So most of you answered no, and the, that's correct. The answer is no. So the law says that the landlords cannot restrict how family child care providers run their family child care home, which would include restricting family child care providers to what days and times they're allowed to operate. Um, providers can offer day, evening, and weekend child care if they choose to. So happy you all got that one. So we can move on to the next, the next hypothetical. So here, um, Tate Tennant is a family child care provider who has moved to a new rental home. He notifies his, his new landlord, Lawrence, in writing of his intent to operate a family child care home. Lawrence then demands that Tate go to City Hall and apply for a city business license. And the question is, does Tate have to comply, um, does Tate have to comply with Lawrence's demand and get a business license? So go ahead and again, um, take the, the poll that pops up for you. I'm going to give you all a little bit of time to answer. And I think we can um, probably show the results. So again, most of you answered no. 
And that's correct. The answer is no. Um, family child care providers only need to obtain a license from the California Department of Social Services Community Care Licensing Division. And cities and counties, counties can't require family child care homes to have a business license. Um, so again, that the answer is no here. Um, and then we'll move on to the next hypothetical with Johnny. Okay, great, thank you. All right, so Tabitha tenant's landlord, Larissa, sent them an email highlighting that their lease agreement said no businesses. Larissa says that this prohibition includes family child care homes and Tabitha must cease operating their family child care home immediately. Can Larissa landlord do this? Yes or no? And we'll go ahead and launch the poll. My apologies, we don't have a poll for this one. Oh, no worries. Okay, well, if you'd like to respond in the chat, feel free, um, but I will go ahead and let you know that Larissa Landlord cannot do this. Yes, a lot of people are saying no, excellent. Yes, so Larissa Landlord cannot do this if a family child care provider's lease says they cannot have a family child care home. That part of the lease is void, meaning that their, their landlord cannot enforce it. And if this was a real life situation, Tabitha could continue providing childcare services from their home without feeling that they were in violation of their lease agreement. And next hypothetical, please. Okay, so Terry Tennant applied to rent Luke Landlord's available unit in Luke's duplex. However, Terry mentioned on his rental application that he is a family childcare provider. Luke is not really a kid person, and he loves how quiet his current space is. Can Luke refuse to rent to Terry solely on the basis that Terry disclosed on his rental application that he is a family child care provider? Thank you for the poll. Uh, either yes or no. And we can, we'll see the answers once the majority of folks have replied. Okay, let's see how everyone answered. All right, great. So the majority of folks said no, and that is correct. It is illegal for a landlord to refuse to rent to a provider just because they have or plan to open a family child care home. Even if that landlord says that they do not allow businesses in the unit, under the law, family child care homes are not seen as businesses for leasing and renting purposes. And next hypothetical, please. Okay, so um, in this hypothetical, Happy Acres is a gated community with a homeowners association or HOA. Under the HOA's covenants, conditions and restrictions, also known as CCNRs, it prohibits residents from operating businesses in their home. Harriet homeowner just moved to Happy Acres and is excited about operating her family child care home from her new space. However, the HOA says that Harriet's family child care home violates its CCNRs because it is a business and is therefore prohibited. Can the Happy Acres HOA do this? And again, the answer is yes or no, and we'll um, launch the poll. And I think we can um, pull up the responses and see. So most folks answered no, and that's correct. The answer is no. Um, covenants, conditions, and restrictions that prohibit the use of homes as a business cannot be applied to family child care homes. Um, so again, no, um, this will, would not be allowed. And we can move on to the next hypothetical, please. Um, so our last in our last hypothetical, Harriet homeowner operates her family child care home from her residence in Happy Acres. However, Happy Acres HOA just received an email from its HOA insurance company canceling its insurance policy because of Harriet's family child care home. The email explains the child care on the property is just too much of a liability and cannot be covered under its policy. And the question is, can the insurance company do this?
So I think we can take a look at the poll responses. I'm um, here, um, most people have answered no, which is correct. Um, the answer is no. And this is because California law prohibits insurers from canceling an insurance policy that has been in effect for 60 days or a renewal policy because of the operation of a family child care home on the premises. This includes homeowners and HOA insurance policies as well. Um, so thanks y'all for running through some hypotheticals with us. Um, we can go to the next slide. Oh, right. So with all the information that Dee and myself just gave everyone, we want to emphasize that we are here to help. Uh, so here is our contact information for both the Child Care Law Center and Public Council. And with that, we might have a few questions to answer and I'll turn it back to Kara. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you again for all of your incredible questions and participation. Um, just wanted to add that if you think that you're being discriminated against because you're a child care provider, you can file a complaint with DFEH. Um, and that's the website address that you can go to. And also we recently, um, in conjunction with the, some of the folks on this webinar, we produced a child care provider fact sheet and that's also available on our website. So yes, let's go to some questions. Um, I'm just gonna, I was looking at the Q&A kind of throughout the presentation. So I can throw out a question or two that I thought was maybe, you know, a common theme or the presenters could also answer some questions. But, you know, I think the number one question I was seeing, um, you know, and we just went over it in the hypothetical is, can, can you both speak a bit to, you know, insurance companies refusing to insure people um, because they have, they're operating child care homes, both if they're renting and if they own a property. Yeah, hi, so, can um, you all, uh, hi. oh, ahead. sorry. This Go is ahead. me too, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, D, do you want me to help answer? Yes. Okay, so um, this is a good question. Um, sorry, hi everyone. My name is Ritu Mahajan. I'm a supervising staff attorney at Public Council. Um, we get this question often, you know, where uh, maybe a child care provider is a homeowner um, and their homeowner's insurance company is saying, you know, we're not going to continue to provide coverage because of your daycare or the child care provider is a tenant and their landlord is telling the, you know, provider my homeowner's insurance company won't continue to provide coverage for me because I'm renting my house to a child care provider. Um, I think as was mentioned in the training, there are laws that prohibit um, these kind of actions by insurance companies. Um, but, um, you know, I think if, if someone is facing this situation, it's really important that they contact an attorney. They're um, welcome to contact public counsel or child care law center so we can really delve into the specific facts of their situation. Um, just big picture, you know, insurance companies are not allowed to do this. However, there are certain caveats in the law that say, if for example, when you first got the insurance policy, the insurer didn't know that there was gonna be any kind of daycare or thought that there was only gonna be one child. And then later, you know, um, the risk like increased quite a bit because the number of children went up. Um, you know, they could argue that they were not made aware of the change, um, and that's why they're denying coverage. So it's it's like a nuanced sort of um, evaluation. So what I would say is please contact Public Counsel or Child Care Law Center if you want to talk about your specific situation. And then I don't know, Dee and Gianni, if you want to add anything to that. Thank you, Ritu. Yeah, I think that summed up um, that issue perfectly. Thank you. Okay. Um, another question that's popping up quite a bit is, can landlords um, require more of a security deposit or can they increase your rent because you are or plan on operating a licensed child care home? So I can answer that question. Um, so I do want to preface that I'm not a fair housing attorney, uh, but the law for the legality behind raising a security deposit is similar to all other rental units as it is for family child care homes. So under the law, landlords can only raise, or excuse me, can only charge a security deposit that is 
two times the amount of the monthly rent if the unit is unfurnished or three times the monthly rent if the unit is furnished. Um, so I do wanna make that point. And the law does state that landlords are not allowed to raise the rent of a unit just because um, a family child care home is in the uh, unit itself. So there is that issue of um, that we do see in the field where landlords will discover and be notified that a family child care home is on the premises and want to raise the deposit rather than raise the rent, which would be illegal. Um, so it's really good to keep that deposit um, rule in mind when interacting with a landlord who's looking to raise uh, a person's deposit. Anything else to add? No. Okay. Um, and there's a question here. Um, somebody is saying that it's hard to get someone to rent to them because their family childcare is how they show income. Um, so any advice to them? So basically it sounds like the landlord is saying, you know, I'm not gonna accept you because your income comes from family childcare. So they're kind of trying to get around that prohibition. Any thoughts on that? So I haven't dealt with this in my personal experience, but um, my colleague, Lori, who's another staff attorney at the Child Care Law Center, might have more guidance on that. Um, but I do, I would say that the law states that it is illegal to deny a family child care um, provider's rental application if they've disclosed that they're a family child care provider and the landlord states that they have an issue with that. Um, but Laura, if you have any information to add, um, yeah, I welcome it. Sure, sorry, I was typing an answer to another question. So the question is if somebody discloses on their rental application that they're a family child care provider, is that the question? If their source of income is uh -huh. family child care. Mm -hmm. Yes, so uh, landlords cannot, cannot refuse to rent to somebody because they are a family child care provider and that includes disclosing it on the application. There's also other um, civil rights laws in California that protect um, providers based on source of income and gender um, discrimination. So landlords cannot discriminate on other protected statuses. Um, Additionally, a provider is not required to put onto their application that they are a family child care provider. Um, we know that sometimes that's unavoidable because landlords want to know your source of income, but um, family child care providers are only required to dis uh, disclose to their landlord of their intent to operate 30 days before operation. And you can always contact the child care law center because we know these situations can be um, fact specific and a little bit tricky. And yeah, I just wanted to, to piggyback on what Laurie said. Um, so one of the, the laws that DFEH enforces is the Fair Employment and Housing Act, and it protects you from housing discrimination based on many things, including source of income. So what that means is a housing provider can't refuse to rent to you because of how you get your money to pay for your rent, you know, and that includes if you operate a, a family child care home, that even includes if you have a Section 8 voucher or, you know, you're a contractor. So, you know, especially if a landlord says, hey, I see that, you know, your income comes from family child care homes and I'm not comfortable with that, um, I would encourage you to file a complaint with DFEH. And um, I'm going to move on to another question. And, um, Panelists, if you see a particular question that you'd also like to answer, you know, please jump in. Um, and I do see um, there's a lot of questions, and I know we covered this also in this presentation. Um, but actually, here's another good one. Um, this person is asking, can a landlord restrict me from using the common area in the backyard? So can they... Can you be restricted um, from using a common area while you're operating a family child care home? Hi, it's Ritu again. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. I had some technical issues. Um, this is an interesting question. Um, it sort of depends on what exactly. I mean, my my argument would be no. They can't 
you know, um, just because you have a family child care, they can't restrict you from using certain parts of the property. It depends on like, let's say it's an apartment building. I had a client once who lived in an apartment building and um, she, she got a letter from management saying, you know, the kids in her care couldn't use the common area during certain hours or just imposing all these additional rules on people with kids. And so we actually um, worked with Housing Rights Center, which is down in LA, to do some advocacy for that provider um, because the rules that that landlord was imposing were found to violate um, uh, prohibitions against discrimination against uh, families with children. Um, and also other forms of, you know, they were engaging in other forms of discrimination. So that landlord did eventually change their policies. But I guess for this person who's asking, I'd want to know, like, what exactly the landlord is trying to restrict. Um, but generally, we want landlords treating family child care just like any other use, like it is considered a residential use. And, you know, th the tenants who run family child care are to be treated like other tenants. But if there's some kind of rules that all tenants are having to abide by that directly impact children, you know, please call us so we can assess whether those rules might be discriminatory. Thank you, Richu. Um, does any, any of the other panelists have anything they want to add to that? Okay. Um, I'm going to ask one more question and then we're going to end, um, but I want to let folks know that we are going to be going through these questions and providing answers and sending them out to um, all of the participants because I know you have a lot of questions. We have, it looks like about 60 or 70 questions. So we want to get to these for sure. Um, is a small family child care provider allowed to apply or live in affordable housing? You can take that question. Um, so I don't believe there's any restriction to a family child care provider operating in subsidized housing. Is that correct, Lori? Correct. Small family child care providers have the same right as any other person applying to live in subsidized housing. Great. All right. Well, I think that that um, gets us to the end um, of our webinar. Um, I, again, want to say thank you to all of the panelists. This was a great discussion. It's very clear from the number of participants and all of the questions that this is an area that people are very interested in learning more about and you know these are protections that you know the people of california really need to know about so again i would encourage you to um, look at the websites um, for both um, the child care law center and public council and um, also look at gfeh's website and again if you think that you've been the victim of housing discrimination based on operating a child family care home, um, please file a complaint with DFEH. And also, again, look for our child care rights fact sheet. So thank you so much to everybody and have a great rest of your Thursday. And if you're seeking MCLE credit, um, I believe the link has been put in the chat. Um, and if it's not, uh, I'm gonna ask that, oh, I'm gonna ask that it gets put in there before. Um, we end the webinar and you can click on that if you're an attorney and get MCLE credit. So thank you again, everyone.